All right, there we go. There's Periscope and there's Facebook. Hello, y'all. Prophet David Taylor here from my second Thursday night teaching on No More Genies. Now, I strongly, strongly encourage you to watch this whole series from the beginning because in the very first episode, I explain everything I mean by No More Genies. But for those of you that are maybe watching this for the first time, um, Many times in our religious backgrounds, and sometimes just by living, just by people talking, you know, myths or whatever, we get the wrong concept of God, and we get what I call the genie concept of God. And another place that we get that from is our own hearts, because deep down in our hearts, what we want God to be and who we want God to be is our personal genie, and we want him to just wave his mighty hand and fix our problems, and that's not who he is, and life doesn't work that way. But genie concept has cost people a lot. It's cost sinners a lot. It's cost, cost believers a lot because they thought that they could tell God what to do. They thought that God has to obey your voice. They thought they could just say the magic word or rub the magic lamp. Or they thought they were in control of life. So many different things. And then they ended up blaming God or they ended up hating God or a whole bunch of things. And I'm going to deal with some of that tonight. But the genie concept of God is what I mean by no more genies. That's what this particular teaching is about. And this is the one I do every second Thursday at 7 o'clock. Because it's so pervasive and it's so detrimental. It, it uh, has caused so much damage. So again, I strongly, strongly encourage you to watch this teaching from the beginning. You can uh, look it up on my Facebook page, hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG. This is actually the 11th teaching in the series. You can also uh, look it up on YouTube. It has its own playlist, uh, PDT, NMG, and I think I have them by year. So I think I have MNG, NMG 2018 and NMG 2019 as well. Okay? So let's get started with tonight's teaching. Let me get a quick drink of water. Let's say a word of prayer, and we're going to dive right in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you just thanking you for tonight, thanking you for instant access to your presence because of the grace in which we stand, because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you do not change. You don't move. You don't flinch. There's not a shadow of turning that you're the same all the time. It doesn't matter what's going on uh, on earth, and it doesn't matter what's going on in our lives. You are stable. You are our rock, and you are worthy of the praise. So I bless your name, God. I thank you for being the rock. I thank you for being stable, oh God. I thank you for being a good God all the time. I thank you for the revelation of your mighty written word. I thank you for the precious Holy Spirit that opens our eyes to your truths. And I thank you for the blood of the cross of Christ, O oh God, that has reconciled all things to you, that has paid the penalty, that allows us to be able to walk in the lives you meant for us to have. So I just want to give you the glory. Tonight, Lord, I surrender to the, the power of the Holy Ghost. I take over my brain, my mind, my lips, my words, my thoughts. Everything, oh God, I surrender to you. Uh, not my will, but thine be done. Use me, oh God. Breathe through me. Speak through me. And let the word spoken be what you want to be spoken. That you might be glorified and that the saints might be edified and that the demons might be terrified. And I thank you for it. We believe you for it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. Amen. So tonight's lesson is entitled Thieves. Thieves. Okay, and let's look at our scripture text, and I will expound on what I mean by that, and I will expound, because remember, this isn't just regular exegetical teaching, where we go into a Bible verse and we examine what it says. This is prophetic teaching, meaning the Holy Spirit gave me the topic, and the Holy Spirit gave me the scriptures, and there's some very specific things that the Spirit of God wants you to hear, so I don't know who it's for, but when something is released prophetically, Whoever it's for, please catch it in the spirit. Please recognize the spirit of God will witness with your spirit when God is talking to you. Okay? So as you watch this, if you're watching me live or if you're watching me on a replay, ask the Holy Spirit of God to witness, give you a witness to when what is said is speaking to you. Okay? Because it's not just exegetical teaching. It's not just me examining a scripture text. It's prophetic teaching where the spirit of God is releasing certain things that he wants to impact the body of Christ, both as individuals and corporately. Okay? You with me? 
Okay, our scripture tonight is a very familiar passage of scripture, but hopefully oh, you're going to hear some new things about it tonight that you haven't heard before. Our scripture passage tonight is John chapter 10, verse 10. Now, John is the fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay, the book of John was written by the Apostle John, the one that beat Peter to the grave, the one that laid his head on Jesus' chest the one that was there at the foot of the cross, and uh, Mary became his mom, and uh, he became Mary's son. That's the Apostle John, not John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Jesus' first cousin, and Jesus' first cousin uh, was born of Elizabeth, uh, Mary's sister, not John the Baptist. This is the Apostle John, okay? Peter, James, and John, not John. The Apostle John wrote what we call the Gospel of John, he also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the epistles, and he wrote the book of Revelation, the very last book in the Bible. That, that's who we're talking about, okay? That John is who wrote this John, okay? So we're looking at John chapter 10, verse 10. Again, a very familiar passage of, of Scripture, but there's going to be some new stuff coming from it tonight that you probably haven't heard before. It says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. When Jesus says they, he's talking about the sheep. He's talking about us. Okay, he's talking about those that believe in him and follow him. Now, I want to start off right off the bat by looking at that word thief because the title of tonight's teaching is thieves. Okay, now in the Greek, uh, kleptes, it says a thief from klepto, a stealer, where we get the word kleptomaniac from. Right off the bat, let me say this. We have equated that word to the devil. So when you hear people quote that scripture, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, people have said that that always means the devil. That is talking about the devil because that's what Satan does. But there are other thieves in your life. That's the first point I want to make. So what I'm saying is don't limit that word thief to just meaning Satan, because there are people in your life that are full of Satan, and there are people in your life that are full of thievery, and they come to steal and kill and destroy. The reason that's so important is because, first of all, in the Greek it says, a thief, from the word klepto, a stealer, but also you have to read the larger context. That's why context is so important. In the context of what Jesus is talking about, he's talking about how he's the good shepherd. He's equating those of us that follow him to sheep and how he wants to keep us safe. He wants to keep us fed. He'll lay his life down for us and um, that he's the only way. He's the gate. So you have to read all the verses around that verse to understand what the Lord is really saying because he's talking about counterfeit shepherds. He's talking about anybody that's not him. He's talking about the effect of someone coming in your life and their, their, their job, their goal, their desire is to steal. You can't just limit that to the devil. That is why so many Christians have bad relationships. Because you keep rebuking the devil, but there's some folks you need to rebuke. What do I mean by that? Then let me get very specific. There are some of you watching me, especially some of you women that were on track for sexual purity before marriage. You made up your mind when you were a little girl that you were not going to have sexual intercourse with anyone and you're going to present yourself to your husband as a chaste virgin. That was your plan. That was, that's what was in your heart. You knew that was right biblically and that's what you were going to do. Then you started hanging around some people that started making fun of you for being a virgin. They started teasing you for being a virgin. They started putting you down, saying that you were some kind of goody two-shoes and you weren't really living life and you were missing out and you didn't know what was really going on and you weren't really a woman and blah, 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 blah. And all that got in your head and the next thing you know, you gave away your purity before you got married and you weren't a virgin. Your husband wasn't your first man and that was originally your plan. What did they steal from you? They stole your purity because that's a one-time gift. You only have one first time. You only have one first love. You can't have two. Okay? And that was something that you fully intended to give to your husband. But you got around some people who, who made you feel bad about your biblical stance. And the next thing you know, and then maybe even you lived a promiscuous life. 
And that's not okay with God for his children. But you had somebody in your ear that made you feel like giving away your purity was a thing to do. See, so how do you discern a thief? Well, the Bible says they steal, they kill, and they destroy, and they destroy. You have to look at the net result of the, their impact on your life. What is your life like with them in it? What is your life like since they showed up? That's how you can tell a shepherd from a thief. Okay? Uh, another thing, uh, those of you that have thieves in your lives, you had people that talked you into doing something that messed up your reputation. Now, my pastor, Apostle John Eckhart, talked about that. He talked about how he realized very early that his reputation, his name, was the most important thing, and he guards it very zealously. And he sets a really good example with that. And I, I'm, I'm very proud to go to a church where my pastor realizes that he doesn't want to get himself involved in everything that says it's Christian or every little thing because his name is so important. And that's such a positive example in these days. But sometimes we have them people in our lives to where you were on track to protect your name. You had a good name and you had a good reputation and here they come. Here they come in your ear talking you into stuff, trying to make you feel like sin wasn't that big of a deal, trying to make you feel like sin wasn't going to cost you that much, trying to make you feel like you know who you think you are, you think you're better than everybody else. Those are the words of a thief. What did they take from you? They ended up messing up your reputation. They ended up messing up your good name. Okay? And then sometimes it, it wreaks consequences that we have to deal with. Sometimes the consequences are lifelong. Because you let somebody talk you into sin and you didn't, you didn't hold on to your good name. They're a thief. They stole that from you. Okay? And if you mess your name up bad enough, it'll destroy you. Okay? So that's how you know the devil and people that are full of the devil. They're thieves. Okay? I'll give you another situation. Uh, this one is also uh, mostly women, but sometimes it happens to men too. You got that friend who's always talking about what they wouldn't take. Like, you're married and they're not. But they're always in your ear talking about, girl, I wouldn't take that from no man. When no husband talked to me like that, and you're like, dude, man, are you a man or what? Would you got to check in with your wife or what? Well, so you just ain't got no gonads no more, huh? That kind of thing. And people like that end up sleeping with your spouse. That same woman that was talking about how your husband wasn't no good and what she wouldn't take, after she moved you out the way, she in bed with him. That same man that was talking about you ain't a real man and you shouldn't have to check in with your wife and you don't have to respect your wife and all that different kind of stuff. And after he moves you out the way, he in bed with her. Hmm. That's a thief. Okay? That's somebody that came into your life and stole your marriage. That's somebody that came in your life and destroyed your marriage because you listened to them because they up here talking about this. That's how you know. I don't know why we all go through this, but I haven't met a person yet that at some point doesn't have somebody like that in their lives. Okay? Let me show you something else. Now, this one, this one is rough. This one can include your parents. Another kind of thief is a dream stealer. Oh, my goodness. If you knew when you were a child, when you were a little boy, you were a little girl, what you wanted to do when you grew up and what you wanted to be, and then somebody talked you out of that. Sometimes that's mama in there. Now, I know some of y'all think that's sacrilege and blasphemy, but your mama ain't God. God is God. Your mama is clay and breath. She's not divine. She ain't the Lord. And sometimes, once you let it be known what it is you want to be, sometimes even your very parents look like they make it a point to stop you from being what you're supposed to be. To snatch that dream right out of your heart. Snatch that dream right out of your head. And you look up and you're 40 years old. And you never went to school where you wanted to go to school. And you never started the business you wanted to start. And you never did the thing you wanted to do. Because when you were really little, somebody, maybe even mom or dad, got in your head and told you that you didn't have a right to live your own life that you didn't have a right to live your own dreams. 
Sometimes that looks like the family business. Sometimes, you know, you come from a family that's strong in a certain area and they have a business in a certain area and they put so much pressure on you when you were young that you had to follow in those footsteps and nobody ever told you that you could live your dream, that you could go to school for what you wanted to go to school for, that you could do with your time and your years what you wanted to do or what God had called you to do. They snatched that dream right out your heart and crushed your spirit when you were a little boy or, or a little girl. And they guilt tripped you so hard, they made you feel like you didn't have a right to your own dream. And that's why to this day, you 40 years old and still haven't lived what you wanted to live. You know why? Because you had a thief in your life when you was, were a child. And somebody came in your life and told you that you couldn't live what you wanted to live. You couldn't do what you wanted to do. Sometimes that's mama and them. Sometimes it's your dad. What if you come from a football family and you want to play hockey? You got five brothers and you're the baby boy. Every brother in your family has played football. Your dad played football. Now he coaches football. He lives and breathes football. And here you come, the baby boy, and you say, Dad, I want to be on the ice. The ice? Yeah, I want to play hockey. That might not go over so well, and they might make you feel bad. They might make you feel that you have somehow betrayed the family line, or they might not support you. What does it feel like? Oh, Lord, because I see, I have been here. I have been in a situation where I was in a concert, and when the concert was over, I saw everybody in the choir break up and go in the, with their families, and nobody was there for me. I was just there by myself. No family there for me. I saw people going out to dinner, making plans, you know, connecting with restaurants, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmothers, and I was there by my black self. So what happens if you're in a football family and you're the baby boy and you want to play hockey and you look up in the stands and all your friends' parents are there and all your friends' grandparents' grandparents are there and, I, and, and you're just out there by yourself? That can hurt you to your heart. And sometimes people allow that feeling to snatch a dream right out their heart and they just give it up. They just say, forget it, because you didn't get any support when you were really young. You see what I mean? That's a thief. That's a thief coming in your life, trying to snatch a dream out your heart. God put your dream in your heart. God made you the way he made you so you could do what he created you to do. And somebody comes along and breaks your heart about it. And then sometimes you just give that dream up. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. here's another one that, that is kind of a subtle thief here's the subtle thief the subtle thief is devaluing time when you let somebody get it in your head when they say well you're young you have time mm, you don't have time to waste God actually has a plan for every area every uh, season of your life so 0 through 10 when you're a little kid 10 to 12 your tween years are uh, your teenage years, 13 through 19, six years, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s, however long you live, God actually has something he wants you to be doing during that time. So you actually do not have time to waste. So that thing when people tell you, well, you're young, you've got time, sometimes people take that to mean that they can go off on a tangent and go off, you know, on a side and go off and do things that are not according to their life plan or not according to the will of God. And when that happens, sometimes it's going to take you 20 years to get back, if you get back. Because some people get out of the will of God and they die. I grew up with people that I saw turn their back on Jesus and they die. And sometimes people end up coming back to God, but it's like 20 years later, 30 years later. Okay, you don't do all that without baggage. If God called you at 20 and somebody told you that you had time, you didn't have to listen to the voice of God because that ain't what the scriptures say. The scripture says, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. God wants you to respond as soon as you hear him. But if somebody got it in your head that you were young and you had time and you decided you wanted to do other things, and by the time you got back to the will of God or where God wanted you 50 years old, you didn't spend that 30 years out there and come back with no baggage. <laughs> you got some stuff you're going to have to work through. Okay, and you burned up 30 years you could have been using uh, to, to spend to build what God called you to build. But somebody got it in your head 
that were because you were young, you had time, and then you wasted time. What's the net result of that kind of advice? It stole two to three decades from you, and then the devil will come and get in your ear and try to completely destroy your dream and say, well, you're too old now. Well, you missed your window. Well, ha, 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 I stole your years. Those are the kinds of things that Satan whispers to you if you were one of those Christians who you heard the voice of God when you were young, but you didn't want to do what Jesus said, and somebody made you feel like, well, you're only 16 years old, so you got time. So you went off and lived this whole other life that was out of the will of God, and you barely survived, and you came dragging back, because many times when we live that way, we come running back into church. We come running back trying to surrender to Jesus because we've made such a mess of things doing it our way. And then the devil's going to try and torment you and say, ha, 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 I stole all them years from you. You see, these are thieves. So it's not just Satan, it's also people. Sometimes it's just bad advice, bad thinking. Okay? So you need to learn how to discern these things in your life. And the Lord says here, if they stole from you, if all that talking didn't do anything but kill your marriage and then there in bear with your spouse, if they stole from you, if they killed anything, if they killed a dream or they gave you some advice or they did something that totally destroyed you, those are thieves. Um, I'll give you another example of a thief that destroys and that's affairs. Sometimes when you have an affair, it doesn't happen every time, but it happens to a lot of people. When you have an affair, the deceptive part about having an affair is you think you can just have the pleasure of that other person. But you can't just have the pleasure. There's going to be a price. That's what King David found out when he saw Bathsheba. He saw Bathsheba naked bathing on that roof. He asked who she was. He went into her. He slept with her. He got her pregnant. Then he tried to bring her husband home off the battlefield so he would sleep with her to make it look like he was his baby, and Uriah wouldn't sleep with her because Uriah said, I shouldn't be having pleasure with my wife when my brothers are in the battlefield. So then King David had Uriah killed. He, uh, The way they fought there, when they would storm a castle, they had archers on top of the castle, and the archers would file the arrows down. King David told them, put Uriah in the front in the heat of the battle and then withdraw the shields from him so that when the arrows come, he'll die. And it wasn't just Uriah that died. It was a lot of people, a lot of men that were unfortunate enough to be in Uriah's company. So King David made a lot of widows that day. And God judged him for all that because he, he didn't get to just go in to another man's wife and just take her and get her pregnant and have that man killed. And King David was going to step on like nothing happened. And God sent Nathan the prophet to rebuke him and tell him all the judgments that were going to come on his life because of what he did. If you ever saw that movie, uh, Fatal Attraction, if you know what that phrase, Fatal Attraction, is about, what it means is you hooked up with somebody on the side and they turned out to be crazy. And then they ended up messing up your whole life, messed up your car, messed up your reputation, got in your home, messed up your marriage, messed up your reputation in front of your kids, messed up your job. They destroy everything because sometimes that's what affairs do. And then sometimes... It's the flip. Sometimes it's not the married person, although that does happen. Sometimes it's the outside person. One of the best examples I have of that is, of course, uh, Monica Lewinsky. She will forever be known because of her relationship with former President Clinton. So, I mean, for the rest of her life, she's going to carry that. He was the one that's married, but she's going to carry for the rest of her life. Remember that, um, that interview she did in Israel? She told them she didn't want to have any questions about Bill Clinton. And the first thing the interviewer said when she sat down was, have you got an apology for Bill Clinton? And Monica just got up and walked off. Because you can't get away from it. I mean, honestly, my heart really kind of broke for her because she can't get away from it. It's like she's trying to talk about online bullying. She's trying to move on with her life. She's trying to do something positive with her fame. And every time somebody gets a chance, they got to bring up the Clintons. They even do that to Chelsea Clinton. What's Chelsea got to do with anything? So that's what I mean when I say sometimes, I mean, that was very high profile, but I'm saying sometimes it's not always a married person, sometimes the, the outside person. And I was just looking at a video the other day. I forgot the pastor's name. It was something like, like, like Bodes Perry or something. Anyway, I was just looking at a video where a pastor was married 
and uh, basically had an affair. And a woman came in his house and shot him, shot him and his wife. But he ended up dying. And the woman said, you broke my heart. So Pastor Perry was married and he had an affair with the side woman. And then whatever it is they did, uh, she took it more seriously than he did because I guess he thought he was just going to have the pleasure of her. And then she came back in his very house, shot him, and he died of his gunshot wounds. Look that up. I think it's Bodez Perry. I think that's his name. But that only happened like a couple of weeks ago. So sometimes that's what happened, man. It, it takes your whole life. It takes your whole life. It takes your whole life. And we end up discovering that sin wasn't worth what it cost. Oh. We end up discovering that, that we thought we were just going to get a little pleasure. We thought we was just going to do whatever, whatever. And then the price tag comes and we find out that it's a thief. Stole your good conscience, stole your reputation. Uh, and then maybe even actually killed you in your life. You see what I mean? So that's why the Lord is trying to show us here about how to recognize thieves. And he's contrasting that to himself. Okay? So the first point I want to make was don't limit thieves to the devil. The second point I want to make is, let's look at the second part of the verse, I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. The second point I want to make is stop having negative expectation of God. One more time. Stop having negative expectation of God. What do I mean by that? I mean, huh, sometimes our biggest hurdle in trusting God is because we don't really know what he wants. We're not really sure of his motives, we're not afraid of you know, what we might have to give up or where we might have to go or, you know, I don't know about this God thing. And the reason that we do that is because we don't believe what he said. He said, I've come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. Now, we're going to look at the Greek in some of those words in a minute. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, and hear me well, remember, this is my, my teaching here is called No More Genies. We do not want a genie concept of God. Hear me well. God has no desire for us to die. If God had desire for us to die, Father God would have never sent Messiah. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they brought death on mankind, God would have just stepped back and been like, oh, well, I told you not to eat that fruit. You got to die now. That's not what happened. They already had a plan. The plan of salvation was already written in heaven before God even made people. Did you know that? Did you know that it was already settled between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost before they made earth that the Son would become human in case mankind ever sinned? They had that plan settled before they ever made earth. That's right. So if, if it was their desire for us to die, then, then the Son of God would have never become Jesus Christ and died that brutal death on the cross for our sins. It never would have happened. Hold on, I gotta hook my phone up because it looks my looks like my battery is done. So let's take care of that. And so that never would have happened if that was God's desire for us to die. Okay? If it was God's desire for us to die, there would have been no Jesus, no Messiah. But sometimes I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example, a real life example of what I'm talking about. There's a friend of mine, and uh, she was ministering in a hospital room because a man had just been in a car accident, and his daughter died. He survived, but his little girl died. And he was bitter and angry and confused, and she was in there trying to minister. And in walks his pastor. Might have been his, his regular pastor or his priest, I'm not sure. And he said, you know, God took your daughter to teach you a lesson. Oh, and that man got so angry and he got so bitter, he cursed God and he cursed the cross and he never, never went back to church again. That's what I'm talking about. When you say crazy things like that to people, like God has some kind of desire to take your child. No, he doesn't. Stop ascribing negative expectation to God. Jesus says clearly that the reason I showed up was so that you could live. And live, uh, we in some versions it says, have life abundantly. 
have life to fullest measure. We're going to look at what that word actually means, though. You're going to be surprised at what that word means in the Greek. But what I'm trying to deal with now is, but you say, Prophet Taylor, what if we find those passages of Scripture where we see judgment, like the days of Noah, when God judged humanity, or Sodom and Gomorrah, or when God judged King David, or what about that? That's a good question, and that deserves a good answer, and here it is. Whenever you see God moving in judgment like that, it's because there is unrepentant sin. Think about it. There's no time in the Bible where you see God moving in judgment, where it's not in response to unrepentant sin, where an individual or a family or a people or a nation, or in the case of Noah, the whole human race, has chosen sin and turned their back on God. Absolutely turned their back on God, absolutely walking in disobedience, absolutely telling God, I'm not going to do none of what you say, I'm disobeying and I'm going to stay in that disobedience. They have unrepentant sin. That's when you see God moving in judgment, when you will not repent. So point number three, so point number two is stop ascribing negative expectations to God. Point number three is you're going to have to take some responsibility. You're going to have to examine yourself and ask the Lord to examine you and ask God, am I doing something that's producing death in my life? In every area, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, vocationally, financially. Okay, seven foundations of life. You have to go to Jesus and say, Lord, am I doing something that's producing death in my life? If I am, please help me repent. Please cleanse me. Please purge me. Because if you stay in that unrepentant sin, it's going to produce death. And if you stay in that unrepentant sin and the Lord has convicted you, and you don't repent, then God's judgment is going to fall. That's what you see in the Old Testament in the Kings, the book of Kings, where the nation of Israel was up and down, and then it got split after Solomon. They got split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and they were up and down, up and down, up and down. Because they kept backsliding. They kept going after other gods. They kept not being faithful to Jehovah. Okay? And when you do that, judgment's going to fall. In the days of Noah, the Lord said that he had, had examined the human race, and we were full of evil, from our youth, he looked into the hearts of humans and he said the whole earth, everybody was full of corruption from the time we were little kids. That's why the floodwaters of Noah came. When God pronounces judgment on King David is because King David took another man's wife and got her pregnant and then tried to pull off a cover up and then had that, man's, uh, had that man killed along with all the other men in his company. And then he took Bathsheba in the palace and was about to step on like nothing happened. Okay, that's why the judgment of God fell on King David, because of his behavior. Because, number two, I told you, stop ascribing negative expectation of God. God has no desire to see you die. God has every de desire to see you live. But number three, you're going to have to take some responsibility. Because if you are living in unrepentant sin, if you are a Christian but you are worshiping something other then the Lord, if you're a Christian, but you're not paying your tithes, okay? If you are doing things that are against the word of God and against the will of God, all out in the open, all brazen, all bold, and it's against scripture and it's against the will of God, then judgment's going to fall, okay? That's Old Testament and New Testament. That's not just Old Testament. Because the Lord says in uh, Revelation chapter 2 about how uh, there's uh, a woman that he calls Jezebel in the church that's teaching and seducing his servants to commit fornication. And he said, I gave her time to repent, and she didn't repent. He said, behold, I'm going to cast all those that follow her into a bed of sickness. And then he says, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches will know that I'm the one that tries the reins in the hearts. That's the New Testament. Okay, let me look that up for you so you don't think I'm making that up. That is Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 20. So I will pull that up right now and read that for you so you understand that I am not making that up. 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, verse 20. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants to be sexually immoral and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Even though I have given her time to repent of her, Ill, her immorality, she is unwilling. Behold, I will cast her onto a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And then I will strike her children dead, <laughs> and all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and I will repay you, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. So that's what I mean when I say the Lord does not have a desire to do that, but he responds that way to unrepentant sin. He even says, I've given her time to repent of her immorality and she was unwilling because the Lord has no desire to destroy us. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. But you are going to have to take some responsibility because if you are living in unrepentant sin, you will draw the judgment of God. I just read it to you. That's the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 20. That's the New Testament. Okay, you can't get any more New Testament than the book of Revelation. Okay, every time you see God moving in scripture in judgment, it's always because of unrepentant sin. It's always because of something that we're doing. A person, a family, a people, a nation. It's always because of something that we're doing that's not pleasing in his sight that we won't repent of. Okay, that's when God moves in judgment. But that is not his desire. His desire is what he said in John 10.10. 10. So that's why I said I'm trying to get rid of that genie concept because it has so many, so many bad effects where you think either that the love of God means you can live any kind of way you want to and God won't answer you. That's not true. Or where you go all the way over on the other side and you feel like God is right around heaven looking for people to judge or throw lightning bolts on or whatever. That's not true. God wants us to live. If he didn't want us to live, he would have never sent Christ. Okay? But we have to take some responsibility on the choices we make. And that's why you hear me say it all the time. You can't just accept Jesus as Savior. You have to accept him as Lord. You can't just accept the fact that he died on the cross for the sin and shed his blood and rose again on the third day. That gets you saved. That gets you born again. That gets you in the kingdom of God. That means you have accepted him as Savior excuse me, a savior. That's Romans 5, 1. But what about the way you live your daily life? What about the way you live every day? What about the choices you make, the life choices you make? Are those surrendered to the will of God or are you still doing your own thing? That's accepting him as Lord, where you have to take up your cross and do what he tells you to do and not what you want to do and not what your flesh wants you to do. And that is day by day for the rest of your life. Okay? But right now, I'm talking about God's heart. I'm talking about his desire. And his desire is not for us to perish in any way, shape, or form. Because he said, stealing and killing and destroying comes from thieves. Okay? Then he says, I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. Okay? That word life there, zoan, life both of physical present and of spiritual particularly future existence, from the Greek word uh, zao, which means life. So in other words, <clears throat> when the Lord says there life, he does not just mean this life. He also means the life to come. So in other words, while we're here on earth in time, the Lord wants us to have fullness of life. And then when we get over into the glory realm, into eternity, he wants us to have fullness of life there. Wow, see, that's mind-blowing to me because the love of Jesus is just beyond. He loves beyond that which is human. He loves me more than I love myself. His, his desire for me is greater than my desires for myself. That's why he tells us to lay down our plan because our plan is always smaller than his. I don't care what kind of grand plans you've got with your life. They're still smaller than God's. So that's why he tells us to lay down our plan so that we can take up his plan because he just said there, when he said, I've come that they have, they have life, he, he means both now in time while we're on earth and when we get over into the glory realm, into eternity with him, he wants me to have the full measure of all of that. See, that's, that's something I couldn't even 
conceive of my own, more or less pull it off. See that? But here comes the next one. I've come that they may have life and have it in, some versions say, and have it more abundantly. Some versions say, uh, have it in its fullness. New Living Translation says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. But I want to look up uh, that phrase, in all its fullness. Uh, it's Strong's Concordance 404, uh, 4053, if you want to look it up, so you know I'm just not pulling stuff out of thin air. It says, superabundant or superior, by implication excessive, adverbially violently, neuter preeminence. Whoa, what does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. It says super abundant. That means much more than enough. It means if you have a meal, you got so much food to you have to share with other people because you got more than enough, more than enough money, more than enough joy. When you have joy in your heart, aren't you laughing? Aren't you smiling? Don't you give smiles everywhere you go? Don't you have kind words for people? Because your heart is full. And when God fills your heart full of joy, it spills over. It says super abundant. And then it says or superior. Now, this is very important. When God gives you a superior life, don't let other people make you feel guilty. Because God will do things for you that you cannot do for yourself. God really will make you the head and not the tail. God really will open doors for you that only he could open. God really will uh, give you connections and like give you discounts and lead you to the best deals. And God really will give you houses that you didn't build and vineyards and olive trees that you didn't plant. And God really will do like you uh, do you like he did Joseph and take you from the pit to the palace in one day and set you over a whole bunch of stuff. Take you from being a Hebrew slave, a convict, to being vice chancellor of Egypt in charge of all the corn, second to only Pharaoh himself. God really will do stuff like that for you. And when he does, people are going to hate on you for it because God will make your life superior. Some life is inferior and some life is superior. And the Bible says God wants to give you superior life. When God gives you superior life, I stop by to tell you, don't feel guilty about it. Because there are definitely people that are going to hate on you and try to make you feel bad because God has blessed you so. Then it goes on to say, by implication, excessive. Oh, Lord, have mercy. King Solomon is one of the best examples of that in the Bible. King Solomon had what we call opulence. He had so much money until all of his drinking glasses were made of pure gold, not gold-plated, not gold rim actual pure gold, and Solomon refused to drink out of silver. <laughs> Solomon had so much money, he said, I'm not drinking out of silver. And I'm talking about pure silver. Solomon had so much money, he said, I'm not drinking out of silver cups. I'm not drinking out of silver chalices. I'm only drinking out of gold. And he had lions on either side of his throne, and Solomon had so much money until it was painful, until the Queen of Sheba just about fainted when she came and saw how much money that he had. Well, God gave him life excessively. He had excess. The Bible says uh, it was 12 or 13 years. It took Solomon 12 or 13 years to build his house. The house he lived in was so opulent, was so rich, was so full. It took him over a decade to build it. See, God can give you life like that. And when he does, you can't let people make you feel bad about it. And then it says adverbially, violently. If you've ever seen how some, some things in nature behave, when life bursts out, sometimes it's kind of violent. You know, birth is normally kind of messy. Normally the baby comes springing out and the baby, you know, is messy. Okay? So in other words, that means that God will give you so much life, it'll be bursting forth. Have you ever been in a situation where there's been so much life, it's just bursting forth where you can't contain it all? Do you see what I mean? Now, I want you to get all those pictures in your head. The Lord said, I've come for you to have that. He said, life, that means in this life and in the eternal realm, in the glory realm to come. But then he says, in all its fullness. He said, it's violent. It's bursting forth. It's messy. It's excessive. It's superior. It's super abundant. He said, that's what I want you to have. So next, 
we're going to go to the next obvious question. <laughs> What's the next obvious question, Prophet Taylor? Here it go. If that's the case, why don't all Christians have it? Haven't you ever heard people call God out like that? That if that's what God wants and that's what the word said and that's what you Christians believe and even some other Christians will fight you. If that's the statement that the Lord makes, how come all believers don't have it? I'll tell you why. Because the only way to get that life is to obey Christ. Mm. You have to do what the Lord is telling you to do, and you're going to have to do it as a matter of living, as a matter of, that's why I said you have to lay down the lordship rights of your life, and you're going to have to learn how to obey God consistently and continually. And that's another point of genie concept that I want to address. When the Lord says he wants us to have life super abundantly and all that, sometimes we can get the picture of Shazam! <laughs> And all of a sudden, it just happens. Now, sometimes it can just happen, but when you get a mighty harvest, you've been sowing a long time, and you've been praying a long time, and you've been fasting a long time, and you've been believing a long time, and you've been confessing a long time, so it didn't come out of nowhere. But sometimes we get the wrong idea in our heads that the abundant life that God wants us to have is going to happen all at once. No, you have to learn how to obey the Lord day by day. You have to learn how to obey him in winter, spring, summer, and fall. You have to learn how to obey him when things are exciting, when things are boring. You have to learn how to obey him when things are up and when things are down. That is why most Christians don't have it. Because, and hear me well, we have been taught or we believe that the abundant life that Jesus speaks of in John 10.10 10 is going to come through magic. It's just, we're going to say the magic word abracadabra and it's just going to happen that's not true it can happen because it happened for people in the Bible like King Solomon but it's not going to happen like magic it's not just going to fall out of the sky it's not going to happen all at once you have to obey do you know why God came to King Solomon as a child and told him he could have whatever he wanted it's because King David, the last great act of King David's life, was to give this huge offering towards the house of God. And I'm talking about in our dollars, maybe millions, maybe tens of millions. King David, the last thing he did was gather up a huge amount of money and then dedicate it to the house of God. That's what broke the heavens open and caused God to come down and release that kind of blank check blessing on Solomon. You see, it didn't come out of nowhere. It's because somebody did something. Because King David made a sacrifice. A huge sacrifice. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. Okay? That there are so many people who are walking around, living any kind of way they want to live, expecting that somehow that's going to result in the abundant life. Lord have mercy, that's not the truth. The truth is, you have to do what Christ tells you to do as a matter of lifestyle over time. And then the abundant life begins to manifest. That's what he said in Deuteronomy 28, that it shall come to pass that if you listen to the voice of the Lord your God and hearken to all his commandments that you may observe to do everything he tells you to do, that then all these blessings come. That's what the scripture says. Okay? So we got to get rid of that magic concept. We got to get rid of that genie concept. We got to get rid of this idea that we can live any kind of way we want to and God's just going to bless us anyway. And we got to get rid of this idea that it's going to happen all at once. That's just going to fall out of the sky one day. None of that is true. You see that? So, uh, so hopefully I've given you some new insights. Uh, I'm sorry, I had an itch in my ear. <laughs> hopefully uh, I've given you some new insights on uh, what this verse means. Because what we want to do is we want to destroy the wrong concepts. And we want to get in the right concepts. So, number one. Don't, uh, to review, number one, don't limit the use of the word thief to just the devil. It does mean Satan, but there are a lot of thieves that can come into your life and steal, kill, and destroy. Okay? And that's how you recognize if something is a thief, if it steal, kills, and destroy. 
destroys anything in your life. Because many times it comes under a guise of pleasure. But what is the net result? Okay, next thing is stop having negative expectation of God. Stop thinking that God has any kind of desire to hurt you, to take anything from you. What does God need from us? Why, why would God need anything from me? Is he hurting? Does he need some corn on the cob or something? No. God don't need me. God don't need nothing from me. He has no desire to hurt me or take anything from me. Okay? But, point number three, you're going to have to take some responsibility because the wages of sin is still death. You still can't live any kind of way you want to and think that God won't judge you because he will. He doesn't want to bring that in your life. But that's what comes when you have unrepentant sin. So you've got to take some responsibility. Okay, number four, that word life, it means fullness in this life, physically present, the, the lives we're living now in these clay bodies on earth. And when we get over into the glory realm, into eternity, he wants us to have all of that too. And then uh, life in all its fullness, that word fullness, I told you, means superior. It means superabundant. Okay, it means excessive. It means adverbially violent. It means life is bursting forth. You got so much life, you can't contain it all. That See, see that just blows my mind. That just touches my heart with the great love of Christ. And then the final point is, why, don't, why doesn't every Christian have that if that's what Jesus wants? Because you have to obey your way into it. That's why. <laughs> you can't be not be paying your tithes and think that God is going to get you're going to get the fullness. You can't be disrespecting your husband as a woman of God, disrespecting your husband in public and private, treating your husband any kind of way and think God is going to bless that marriage and think God is going to bless your children. You're greatly mistaken. You can't be lazy. You can't have a bad work ethic. You can't be, as the Bible calls it, slothful. You can't, if, you're, if your checking time is 8 o'clock and you normally get to the gig at like 8.45, <laughs> that's not funny. You get to the gig 8.45, 8.50, you are an hour late every day, and they give you 30 minutes for lunch, and you take two hours for lunch, and you're supposed to leave at 5, you start packing up at your, your desk at like 4.15, you, oh, you're not going to prosper like that. You can't do that. You can't have that kind of lifestyle and think this abundant life that Jesus is talking about is going to come your way. And that's where people have gotten deceived. Now, you've heard me say it before, but I'll say it here again. There is no such thing as prosperity gospel because prosperity has always been a part of the gospel. There's never anyone at any point in the scripture that obeyed God that didn't prosper. There's no such thing as a separate prosperity gospel, okay? But there is such a thing as the false prosperity gospel. And the false prosperity gospel says that you can do whatever you want and God is just going to bless you anyway. And I've discovered that's what a lot of people have been taught. And I've discovered that's a lot of the, the idea. And people that aren't Christians have that idea that, that the prosperity gospel means, you know, if you just give a bunch of offerings or you just, you know, do the hokey pokey and put your left foot in and put your right foot out and you say the magic words that God is just going to rain all this money on you. And that's not in the Bible. That's not, it doesn't work that way. So that's why I can't stress enough to you. And once again, I say it every week. I'm doing what I'm preaching and teaching. I'm doing what I'm telling you to do, okay? Trying to obey God in every area of my life. When God tells you to do something, like sometimes when you're in situations, God doesn't want you to do anything but praise him. So when the Lord tells me to praise him, I'll praise him. Sometimes you want to try to work the situation out, and God tells you don't do that. God tells you just give him some praise. That don't make no sense to the natural mind. But I talked about praise last Sunday about what it actually does. Because it does make sense in the spirit. But the point I'm trying to make is that I'm doing the same thing I'm saying to you right now. I'm, I'm trying to HBO as best I can. I'm trying to hear Jesus, trying to believe what he says and obey him so I can have that life that he wants me to have manifest. Where my life would just be bursting forth with so much life I can't contain it. The only way you get that, my brothers and my sisters, it's through obedience. Some people, you're in a town and God called you to move to another town 10 years ago. Some of y'all still in Chicago and God called you to move to another city 10 years ago and you're still in Chi-Town because you don't want to go. That's why your blessings haven't come because you were disobedient. You have not obeyed what the Lord said. Some of y'all got married to the wrong person. Everybody told you before you got married that they weren't the one 
and you knew in your spirit there wasn't one, and you walked down the aisle anyway. Now you're unhappy. That's because you did not obey. The Lord told you that wasn't the one to marry. Okay? Some of y'all tried to, God tried to prepare you for your financial crisis, and uh, he told you to give an offering in service, or he told you to save up, save up some money, and you didn't do it. And then crisis came, and then you were hurting. God tried to, to, to get you into the river of financial flow by giving that offering or to save up some of the money that you have, but you didn't do it. So now you're in crunch time. You see what I mean? We have to obey. We have to obey to get it. It's not magic. Okay? All right. So that's our teaching for tonight. I want to move on to the next portion. Now, if you have any prayer requests, please put them on the screen. Please put them on the screen now so I can pray for them. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to go into the portion where I ask the Lord about uh, physical healing, deliverance from demons, financial deliverance, and uh, any other prophetic words he wants me to give. Okay? When you see me close my, close my eyes and begin to speak in tongues, I'm, I'm speaking to the Holy Ghost and charging up my spirit so I can hear what the Holy Ghost has to say about those areas. But if you uh, have any prayer requests, okay, put them on the screen right now. Okay? All right. Here I go. Oh, yes. Okay, God is saying somebody's hurting in their feet. Okay, somebody's hurting in their feet. So right now, put your hands on your feet. If you can't reach all the way down to your feet, put your hands on your knees and say this. Say, in the name of Jesus, I command my feet to be 100% whole. My veins, my arteries, my muscles, my, my skin, my toes, my toenails. I command my feet to have all five toes to be 100% whole. I command my blood to flow freely, thoroughly, and correctly through my feet. And I command strength in my feet right now in the name of Jesus Christ because by his stripes I am healed. Okay? Okay, the Lord is telling me somebody's having problems with their nose. You might be having sinuses or allergies or you might have a broken nose. Somebody might have hit you or something like that. Put your hand on your nose. It might be tender. Put your hand on your nose. Say, in the name of Jesus, I command my nose to be 100% whole. Everything straightened out, everything in order, blood flowing, uh, breath flow. I command my nose, cartilage and all to be whole right now in Jesus' name. Because in the name of Jesus Christ, by his stripes, I am healed. Okay? Okay, that's it. Praise God. All right, so hope you got something out of tonight's teaching. I hope you can go forward and walk in the power of the word and do what the word actually says do. I hope, you know, by doing this teaching, I'm destroying genie concept. I'm destroying it in my life. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm endeavoring to live uh, the way the Bible says, everything that I'm teaching you, I'm doing it. And I don't want to have any wrong concepts of God. I don't want to have any wrong expectation. That's why people end up getting mad at God, because your expectation was wrong. It's not that God did you wrong. It's your expectation was wrong, because you had a genie concept. You thought you could just tell God what to do. You thought you could tell life, this is how this going to go, as if you were in control. No, 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 no. See, God don't follow me. I follow him. God does not obey me. I obey him. God does not bow down before me. I humble myself. I bow down before him. That's the way it works. He's not just my Savior, he's my Lord. And as I obey him, his blessings manifest. All right? Great, great, great. All right. Well, thank you, those of you that joined me live tonight. God bless you. I want you to go forth. We need to start manifesting this abundant, excessive life because that's what's going to make unbelievers want to believe in Jesus. When we're broke, busted, disgusted, sick, when we have bad marriages, bad relationships with our children, when we have a bad work, work ethic. Okay, uh, Sally Butler, you want to pray for revelations? All right. Right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Sister Sally Butler, oh God, I pray that you would open her, her eyes, take her to a higher level, a higher water level in the prophetic, help her to see more in the spirit, help her to understand more in the word, and help her to share more to the edification of the body of Christ as you give her these increased revelations. And I thank you for it, and I believe you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Teaching anointing. Father, that you would give her the teaching anointing, oh God, that if it is your will for her to begin to teach, 
that you would anoint her with your ability to teach the exegete of Scripture, to hear the Holy Ghost, to move in the prophetic, to expound the Word of God, to expound your messages in such a way that people are drawn to you, O oh God, that we're always drawn to you, because it's never about us. It's always about you, Jesus. I, I give you the praise, Jesus. You're the one that's divine. You're the one that has and is the tree of life. You're the one that's the good shepherd. And it's your name that's above every name. So I give you the glory, Jesus. So even as we ask for the teaching anointing, uh, for the teaching, oh God, so that people would be drawn to you, so that people, so that you would be glorified, so people can have a good concept of you, so people can have a healthy view of you, Jesus Christ, so we can love you and serve you and obey you and begin to manifest the life you died to give us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Sister Sally, God bless you. So, yeah, so let's start walking in that abundant life so that unbelievers can see the difference that God makes. Because if they can't see a difference in our lives, why would they ever want to follow Jesus if, if our lives aren't any different, if our lives aren't abundant? But it's going to come through obedience, not magic. Okay? All right, God bless you. All right, I have a book signing on Saturday. But I'll be uh, back here on Sunday for my regular time. Yeah, so we're all good. So another busy weekend. <laughs> but thank you so much for tuning in live. Thank you so much for those of you that have watched the replay. Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube, God bless you. And uh, remember, the Lord wants us to have excessive, abundant, superior, uh, uh, violent, bursting forth life. But it's going to come as we obey him. God bless. Have a good night and have a great weekend.